Hi everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for our webinar today, QuickBooks Online Plus for new nonprofit users. Before we get started, I just want to go over a few housekeeping items so all callers will be muted. If you have questions, feel free to use the chat box that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. If you have to drop off early or if you want to watch the webinar again, we will be emailing out a recording and a copy of the slides once the webinar is over to your email. And we'll also be hosting it on our website at TechSoup.org slash community slash events dash webinars. If you're on social media, feel free to tweet at us at TechSoup using hashtag TSWebinars. Um, but like I said earlier, we'll be using the chat box that you see on the left-hand side of your screen. So just a little bit about TechSoup before we get started. We are in 236 countries and territories, and we serve over a million nonprofits around the world. We partner with several technology companies like Adobe, Intuit, Microsoft, Symantec, um, and several others, hardware and software, uh, to make our mission possible, offering donated or discounted technologies. We also offer several other um, things outside of hardware and software, it, uh, like tech consulting, apps for change. We have TechSoup courses. Uh, we have cloud consultancy, so several other um, services offerings as well. So before we get started, I just want to make sure that you guys can hear me okay. So if you don't mind um, trying out the chat box, and telling me what city you're calling in from. And I'll read out a few just to make sure you guys can hear me. All right, Tucson, Dallas, Vallejo, Reno, Orlando, San Francisco, Knoxville. Okay, perfect. So you guys are calling in from all over the country. Awesome. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and make introductions. So my name is Seema Tucker, and I'm the Senior Manager of Content here at TechSoup. My colleague Zareen Kazi is the Marketing Associate at TechSoup, and she'll be uh, helping out on the back end if you have any technical questions. And then um, we have our main speaker, Greg Bosson. So Greg Bosson is the founder and CEO of QuickBooks Made Easy. Uh, Greg is a practicing CPA and advanced certified QuickBooks Pro Advisor with a full-service accounting firm located in Atlanta, Georgia. He's also the founder and CEO of QuickBooks Made Easy, and since 2000, Greg has been teaching live QuickBooks seminars around the country specifically designed for nonprofits. He is considered to be a national expert in the program. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off. And actually, before I do that, we also have Bill Sims, who's uh, Greg's colleague, who's going to be um, jumping in here and there also. So I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to Greg. Thank you, Seema. And how's it going, everybody? Uh, I'm Greg Bosson, and first thing I want to do is kind of like Seema, I want to make sure everybody can hear me. So just give me like a hi or a hello or something in the chat, and let me know whether or not I sound too loud, too soft, or just right. Let me know if I sound okay. Anybody think everybody says I sound good? Yes, you can hear me. You can hear me. That's wonderful. All right. So everybody seems happy, so that's great. Oh, Leslie's from South Georgia. I'm from Atlanta. I don't know. Where in South Georgia are you from, Leslie? Um, but anyway, so um, I want everybody to uh, understand that this is not your typical webinar, all right, because I'm going to be asking you a lot of questions. I'm going to be waiting to hear answers. I'm going to be calling you out by name. Oh, Augusta. Okay. My, my, uh, oh, Douglas lives in Augusta. Oh, Leslie's near Valdosta. All right. All right. But anyway, we'll, we'll move on from there. Uh, but anyway, these are small, smaller towns. Uh, but anyway, so uh, I want you to understand that you've got to pay attention. This isn't one of those things where you're going to be like kind of half doing stuff. You're on Facebook, blah, 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 because I will be calling you out because we're going to be learning here. So uh, the objective today uh, is to understand, first of all, the different QuickBooks products and what's best for you. Uh, and for most of you probably already have QuickBooks, but um, just want to cover that for a second to understand what the different choices out there in case you hear somebody saying, hey, why didn't you get to this version or something? You know, so you understand kind of where you are in the pecking order. Uh, then uh, we'll talk about QuickBooks Online uh, and uh, basically help you get around in the program. And then we're going to give you the basics of how to properly set up your organization in QuickBooks. That's kind of what we're, what we're going to do here. Uh, this next just kind of lets you know you can buy QuickBooks online uh, directly from, um, uh, from TechSoup. And uh, I don't know why it is. 
Oh, there we go. Right. I was looking for my little arrow here. You see QuickBooks Online, you can get a one-year subscription for $50 from TechSoup. So if you are already on QuickBooks and you're like, what? <laughs> I'm paying $30 a month or $40 a month, you need to get it from TechSoup. And we'll talk more about that in a second, okay? So if you're freaking out now, don't worry, because it's only $50 a year versus a monthly if you get it from TechSoup. So TechSoup's awesome. But anyway, so again, myself, um, I am a CPA with an accounting practice in Atlanta, Georgia, so very much like the person who does your financial statement audit or your 990, that's me. Um, I do about 30 audits a year of nonprofits. I do about 100 990s a year. We have hundreds of nonprofits around the country that call in with tech support agreements. Um, so I do all of that. Um, but then I also own QuickBooks Made Easy. And QuickBooks Made Easy is basically all about teaching nonprofits how to use QuickBooks. And we do this through training products that are on DVD. They come along with a handbook, although they're streamable now, so you can stream them as well. Um, and we also have tech support agreements, and then we have live seminars around the country. And I do want to, and we have webinars as well. Now this webinar is only an hour and a half, which isn't very long, um, but I want to point out something that's coming up. On May 21st, 22nd, and 23rd, we have our online, this is our QuickBooks online webinar series. It's two hours a day for three days, and we're going to give you a pretty big discount um, if you sign up, we've got to give you a coupon. Uh, we're also going to give you a coupon to get discounts off of tech support. We'll do that uh, later on. You've got to see whether or not I'm any good, right? So um, these are the codes right here, but we'll show them again a little bit later on. So let's not worry about that right now. So uh, the first thing that I want to talk about is the different versions uh, oh, you know what, before I even do that, let's do a poll. I forgot about this. So I want every single person to answer this question. This gives me an idea of where you are in terms of your uh, experience with QuickBooks. How new are you to QuickBooks? And I want everyone to answer it. Never seen it, scared and nauseated. Saw it, closed it, still nauseated. Um, kind of know QuickBooks, but not really well. Uh, I know QuickBooks, but I don't know it for nonprofits, which is important. It's very different for nonprofits. Um, uh, I do know QuickBooks for nonprofits, but I have questions. And then I'm a QuickBooks master, and I'm just here to heckle you. So we've got 174 people in the room. We've had about 100 people answer. So we've got 74 people that are not listening to me right now, which is very upsetting. You know, I have a lot of emotional issues, and I need to have a lot of attention paid to me. Bob? Brad, Brenda, Cassie, Chris, Dale, Dawn, Jessa, Joanne, Judith. Is everybody answering? Keep going. I want every single person. Catherine, Maria, Mary Beth. I love that name. Mary Beth, get off the phone and answer. All right. So Adrian, ah, Jess is here. Okay, great. All right, so let's go ahead and show you the results here, and we'll see. Now, it looks like... We've only got about the first two, about 20% of you, 18.5% of you are nauseated whenever you see QuickBooks. So that's not bad. About half of you kind of know QuickBooks, but not that well, and that really helps me. Uh, and then we have about 30% of you that know QuickBooks um, but have questions about nonprofits. So that kind of gives me the lay of the land here. So thank you very much for that. Uh, so this is our agenda for today. We're going to talk about what QuickBooks is uh, and what it's not, um, and uh, uh, what QuickBooks products are available, what's best for you. That's only going to take a second, guys. Don't worry. I'm not going to waste your time with that too much. Then we're going to spend the rest of the time in QuickBooks, so almost an hour and 15 minutes in QuickBooks, going over um, how to get around, how to set things up. We'll have some time at the end to enter budgets, and we'll be answering questions throughout. Okay, so thank you, Reg, Rachel. I see that. Uh, Brenda's never seen it. So I, isn't this kind of cool? You can type something and then I can like see it. It's real neat. Technology is cool. All right, so what is QuickBooks? First of all, this is pretty basic, but it's a financial software package, and they just always, TechSoup always likes me to point this out. It is an accounting package. It will give you financial statements, but it also will track your invoices. It will track your expenses. It will print checks. Um, it will do payroll and process credit cards, but you have to pay for that. And then people always want to know, is QuickBooks a decent database? And yeah, it is. You can get donor reports. You can get donor letters. 
Now, you have to understand how to set things up and enter transactions so you can get that. It's a little bit beyond the scope of this uh, webinar, but uh, it is something that we'll be covering in our three-day webinar series. So you might want to pay attention to that if you want to use QuickBooks as a donor database. So that's kind of the deal with that. So QuickBooks Options. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here because I want to tell you – let me go ahead and share the screen. All right. So right now, you should be hopefully uh, seeing my screen. And what you should be seeing is the, uh, the screens in QuickBooks Online. So somebody chat me, at least one person, and tell me that you're looking at – you see this number, 143,211. Does everybody see it? Okay, great. Now the other thing I want to know is, is it too small? Is it too big? Or is it just right? Anybody think this is too small? Does anybody think it's too small? Tell me if the screen's too small. Uh, Bob says it's small. Uh, Tracy says it's small. So you can kind of maximize. It, it's kind of hard to make it bigger. Now I do have this little zoom thing. And I'll try and remember to do that from time to time for those of you that have a really hard time seeing it. But um, uh, I think if you get rid or collapse your chat box, then it gets a little bit bigger. So um, anyway, so we'll try. Uh, Ed says the audio is cutting out a bit. Is there anybody else that is experiencing that? Uh, let me know. All right. So uh, all right. Bob says it was better when he expanded his screen, so that's good. All right, so let's move. So what you are looking at here, the first thing I want to cover is the different choices of QuickBooks, and what you're looking at is the online edition of QuickBooks, which is what this webinar is about. Now QuickBooks has another edition. It's called the Desktop Edition, and that's what this one looks like. So this is the desktop. This is the online. If you are looking at the screen and you say, this is what your QuickBooks looks like, guess what? you in the wrong webinar. Okay, This webinar we did two days ago. So is there anybody who is in the wrong webinar? So go ahead and chat if they're in the wrong webinar so that the people at TechSoup can uh, make a note of it and they may be able to send you um, a uh, copy of the webinar that we did a couple of days ago. All right. So just curious, is there anybody that's in the wrong webinar? Chat me up if, they, if you are. I want to see if anybody's in the wrong webinar. Yes, Sandy. Oh, Rosemary's in the wrong webinar. Okay. So uh, Aaron's in the wrong webinar. Yeah, this, is, this was done two days ago, Aaron. We're in this one right here, and this is what we're going to learn today. All right? So those of you that are in the wrong webinar, let them know through the chat, and uh, they will take care of you and give you a copy of the one from two days ago. All right. So um, this is the online edition. Now, I think the next thing that I want to explain to you is that there are different choices of the online edition. And I think probably the easiest way to do this is just to go into QuickBooks.com, and I'm going to show you the different choices of QuickBooks. So you, if you go into QuickBooks.com and you say you want to buy QuickBooks, these are all the different choices. Okay, and I'm going to zoom in just so you can see it. So there are actually five choices. There's Simple Start, Essentials, Plus. There's this new one called Advanced. And then there is this one all the way over in the right called Self-Employed. Now let me tell you right now, of these, the only two that I want you to use is either Plus or Advanced. The reason why is because these other three, Simple Start, Essentials, and Self-Employed all the way to the right, they will not have budgeting, and they will not allow you to track your programs. So you must use either Plus or Advanced. And to be honest with you, Plus is fine. And Plus is the one that you can get at TechSoup. Look at how it's $30 a month. It says here it's really $60 a month. You just get that discount for a few months, and then it goes up to $60 a month. The one at TechSoup is $50 a year. All right? so, um, and let me just cover this right now. So Plus is the one I want you to have. And if you don't know, by the way, which one you have, uh, let me go ahead and show you what to do. When you dial into your QuickBooks, and here's QuickBooks right here, if you want to know which one you have, and there's a couple of different ways of doing this, but if I click on the gear and I click on Account and Settings, 
This takes me to what I call the preferences that QuickBooks has. That's what they call it in the desktop version of QuickBooks. But in the online, it's called Accountant Settings. I'm going to click on that. And it's important that you know where your preferences are because you may very well be going to those preferences to do certain things. There are things you can turn on or off. But if you go to Billing and Subscription, this is a, a column. These are the different categories of preferences over here. And if you click on the one that says Billing and Subscription, Kimberly, you get the plus version with $50. You get the plus version with $50. Okay? All right. So it tells me right here I'm getting the plus version right here. So this is will tell you which version that you have. All right? So now the next thing, uh, if you have um, – is this the online QuickBooks webinar? Julianne, yes it is, and we've just gotten started. Okay? Now if you have the um, online version of QuickBooks, in other words, your QuickBooks looks like this, but you're not getting it or you didn't get it from TechSoup and you're paying a monthly fee, give me a chat. Chat me up if you're paying a monthly fee for this thing. Let me know. Let me know. Is anybody paying a monthly fee for this because they didn't get it from TechSoup? Anybody? Okay, so Carla is. Uh, Gwen's paying monthly. Yes. So if you're paying monthly, obviously you don't want to do that anymore. So what you want to do is you want to get the online edition through QuickBooks, all right? I mean through TechSoup. So to get that, what you have to do is you have to basically back up your online file that you have now and then restore it to a new online account that you get through QuickBooks Online. So it's a little, it's a little dicey. Um, the way to back up your online file, and this is something people want to know anyway, if you have QuickBooks Online, there really isn't a need to back up the data file because it's very safe, it's double encrypted, it's in a server somewhere in a cave in Pennsylvania, um, and it's in multiple locations, extra copies of it. But if you still are the kind of old school person where you're like, I want to back up, I'm going to tell you about a site called Chronobooks. CHRChronobooks.com. Chronobooks, and I don't get any money from them or anything, but this, this little software, it will allow you to back up, restore, and copy your QuickBooks Online Edition, and it's, only, it's free. And that's what you'll need to do to back up the one that you're paying monthly for and to upload it to the new one that you get through TechSoup. All right, so uh, yes, Floyd, you, if you are not a 501c3, you can't get QuickBooks through TechSoup. Sorry about that. All right, so uh, there we go with that. So now that I've talked about the different versions and the one that is best for you, the other thing that I want to tell you is that the thing about QuickBooks Online, one of the things they like about it is with the desktop, Every time they made a change to the program, they had to push out the change. You had to download the change onto your machine because that's where QuickBooks was, and then you had to install it, and blah, 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 blah. So it was a big pain in the butt. With the online edition, they don't have to do any of that because they house the program. It's not on your computer. It's on their server, so they can just make a change. The downside of it is that, and you know this, You'll open up the program, and all of a sudden there will be this new thing on there that you didn't know was there before. It wasn't there before. Or maybe something's in a different place. Like this stuff over here used to be in the middle. Now it's on the right. They change the wording here. I mean, they change things all the time. And they don't really tell you about them. It's just changed. So if you are curious – if you want to know what changes in QuickBooks, because they usually make a change every month, if you go to this website, it's quickbooks.intuit.com blog what's dash new. Okay? Quickbooks.intuit slash blog slash what's dash new. And let me actually, let me zoom in so those of you can actually see the URL and you can write it down. This website will tell you what's new every single month in QuickBooks. Pretty cool, huh? So uh, I bet you're busily writing it down right now. Uh, <clears throat> but anyway, 
So uh, if you look here, you see what's new in QBO. That's a fancy smancy term they call QuickBooks Online uh, for February. And then you click it and it will tell you what's, uh, what's new. There we go. Thank you, Zareen. She, she posted the point. So anyway, so that's a very uh, cool little thing to go to. So let's talk about how to get around in this program. Um, and those of you that kind of know QuickBooks, you're still going to learn even if you know it pretty well. But understand, there's about 20 to 25 people in this class that have never even seen it before. So let's just be cool with me. This will just take a second. I'm going to get them used to the screens, okay? So when you go into your QuickBooks Online account, and you, you, it's an online account. So I, I should really even start by just you go to your QuickBooks login. I think it will just pop me right to it. But it takes you to a screen where you put in your username and your password, and then once that's in, then you get to the screen. And this is called the home page or the dashboard is what they call it. It has a lot of screens on here that won't really be very helpful to you. Okay? Um, the expenses will be helpful. It gives you your expenses. It's in a little chart. It's kind of cool. You can change the date range here. But the income and the sales line may be blank for you. And the reason why is if you are not using the sales forms to enter your transactions, these will be blank. This says income. It only relates to income that has been invoiced to a customer, which means you go to the invoice button and you enter invoices. And there are some nonprofits that enter invoices out of QuickBooks, but most of you don't even do invoicing. So most of you, this income line will be blank because you don't do invoicing, so this will be meaningless. Same with sales. If you don't use the invoice form or another form in QuickBooks called a sales receipt, which turns out to be a very important form, if you don't use that form to enter your income, this will be blank too. So if you are just a downloading person and you signed up for QuickBooks Online and you just download it and think everything will be perfect, these two things, reports, will be blank for you, which is fine but you can't make them go away. The point is, is that most of the stuff that's on the screen here is kind of junk and not very helpful to you. So I'm going to give you the three main places that you're going to need to go to do things in QuickBooks. If you want to set things up, which is what we're going to be doing today, setting things up, you see this tiny little gear thing. Some people think it looks like a flower, but it's a gear. It's at the top right of your screen. Sorry if I'm speaking like you don't know anything about computers because, I mean, I'm just trying to teach for everyone. But anyway, I know a lot of softwares have these gears. But if you click it, this is where you go to set things up. For instance, we're going to set up our chart of accounts in a minute, and this is where your chart of accounts is. All right? Now, if you don't want to set things up, but instead you want to enter transactions, that's what you do with the plus sign. You can think about it this way. I'm adding a transaction. So if you click plus, this is where you go to do a check. This is where you go to do a bill. This is where you go to make a deposit. Now, you might be saying to yourself, Greg, I don't go any of those places. I just download. And that's true. But let me tell you something. If you download transactions, it's effectively the same thing as either doing this check window or doing this bank deposit window. Either way, you still got to get the chart of accounts set up correctly so that you know where to point your transactions. And that's the point of what we're going to do today. We're going to look at how to set up the chart of accounts correctly. But anyway, so this is where you go to set things up. This is where you go to add transactions unless you download. Your downloading of transactions happens in these windows. You just click it and it gives you a list of transactions that have been downloaded from the bank, and then you add them here. Okay? The only other place that people go to, uh, I'm just going to click on the dashboard to get back up to the main dashboard. The only other place that people go to is this report section. This is where all of your reports are. So if I click on it, say I want to get a P&L, profit and loss, you just click it, and here's where your profit and loss is. Don't have a lot of stuff going on there. But I can change the date range so that it will actually give me some data, all dates, and then I'll click Run. There we go. So let's do this again. Let's go over this real quick. Where do you go to set things up? This little gear here. 
Where do you go to add transactions? You tell me. Where do you go to add transactions? Type an answer. I want to know. Where do you all go to add transactions? Yes, the plus sign. Thank you very much, Biden. So that's where you go to do that. If you do download, you'll go to the blue section. And this little thing over on the left with all these words, I don't barely go here. The only time I go here is when I'm looking for reports. And that's it. Oh, Timothy calls it a Phillips screw. It is a Phillips screw. I've never even heard of that before. That's awesome. All right. But anyway, so that's um, basically all I need to say about getting around in the program. Does anybody have any questions that I was not able or didn't get to about how to get around in the program? Anybody have a question? Ooh, how do you download? Huge question. So basically, in order to download, there, I have a whole webinar just on that. But you see where you go to Connect Accounts? You click Connect Accounts right here. You put in your bank, and you can download from a credit card or you can download from a bank account, either one. If it's a credit card and it's with Visa or MasterCard, you pick the bank that it relates to. And there's more than just these. There's more than just these. You can type any bank you want here and it will appear. But I'm just going to type uh, Amex, and here's my Amex. You can download. Amex is their own bank. You click it. it you put in your username and your password. You click Continue, and that's how you link your account. Once the account is linked, mine's already linked, it will start downloading transactions, and it downloads them every day. They don't go into QuickBooks directly. Rather, they simply go into this list, which is over here. And then when you're in here, you pick – it says Category, but what they really mean is Account. You pick the account that you want it to go to. So I'll click on here, it says category, but they really mean the account, which is the expense and income accounts in your chart of accounts list. All right? So Katrina, how easy it is, is it to migrate from the desktop? It's very easy, Katrina. They're going to make, you, make it easy for you. If you click on your desktop version, first thing you do is set up an account with the online edition. Once you set up an account, it will be like a skeleton company with just the name of the company and nothing else. You don't need to put anything in it. Then you can move all of your data into it by going over to where it says Company and Export Company File to QuickBooks Online. You click here. You put in the uh, username and the password for your QBO, your QuickBooks Online account and it will upload it for you. So it's pretty simple to do. My dashboard looks different from you. Is the dashboard customizable, Holly says. In the online edition, it really isn't very customizable at all. So um, my guess is maybe your screen is smaller than me, so things are organized a little bit differently. Uh, maybe some of the names are different. Maybe yours looks like this. But it should be the same. All right. Oh, Rachel, welcome back. All right, so uh, is there anybody else that has a question? What if you want to upload a QuickBooks that is not an online version? Just showed you how to do that. Uh, do, you, do your memorized reports and transactions transfer over? When you go from desktop to online, Lisa said they do not. Uh, you'll have to re-memorize your reports again. Sorry about that. Um, on my dashboard, the P&L card just shows income. Is that all income? are just the invoices like the income card. No, the P&L card, she's calling it, is all your revenue. This is basically all anything that hits an income account. So I'm not sure why it is that it's not showing your expenses, because it should be, unless you didn't enter any expenses or you entered them incorrectly. All right, so um, I, want to, uh, I want to move on to the chart of accounts list. And I'm going to do a couple of things here. Uh, the first thing, I, I'm going to talk about the chart of accounts list, but I do want to point – oh, there is one more thing. I'm sorry. There's one more thing I want to point out here. Anytime you are in QuickBooks and you are looking at a window, you're basically looking at a web page. So I want you to look at this page. You see the web address of the page that we're on? And I'll just zoom in so you can see it a little bit better. You see how it says it's https forward slash forward slash c 13qb blah, blah, blah. Okay, that's, it's just kind of hammering on. This is a web page. So if you go to a different screen, 
say I want to open up a report. I'm going to click on, uh, I'll go to a P&L report. I want you to look at the web page. See how the address changed? It's a different address. So every single time you open up a window, it's a new web page. So how do you suppose you would be able to see two windows at the same time? And y'all tell me. What do you think? Uh, Charmian, it, you, it uploads everything. You don't choose a date. All right? Okay, so how would you um, – uh, yeah, you, Amy's right. You have to open up a new tab. And I answered Charmia's question. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, you have to open up another tab. Now, I'll make it easy for you to see how to open up another tab. First of all, I'm in Chrome, which is what Intuit suggests that you use when you're using QuickBooks. It just works better than the others. But I'm going to go to this tab in Chrome. I'm going to right-click it, and I'm going to click Duplicate, and it automatically don't have to sign in again. It just takes you to another, uh, another uh, second instance of the program. I'll go in here, and I'm going to change this, and I'm going to look at a different report. I'm just going to look at a balance sheet now. So this is the balance sheet, and this is the P&L. So if you want to see them at the same time, you kind of have to separate them out so that you can see them at the same time. You see what I'm saying? So uh, that's kind of what the dealio is with that. But one of the reasons why I like to, sh I like to show the balance sheet and the P&L, um, let me see if I can get them both so that you can see them real easily. You kind of have to maneuver the screens a little bit to get them so you can see them together. The best thing is if you have double screens. If you have dual monitors, and monitors aren't that expensive, um, and you're like, yeah, right, I'm a nonprofit. They'll never get me another one. But it makes life so much easier in general, but certainly in QuickBooks, because it's very easy to just see two, uh, uh, two um, screens at once. I'm going to move this thing over. There we go. And let me move it in a little bit and make it smaller. See how much of a pain this is? But now I can see them at the same time. Oh, one thing too that uh, I think is kind of cool, you can make this bar go away on the left-hand side. You see these three lines? If you make it go away, uh, then, uh, and I'll squeeze it in a little bit. Now I can really kind of see both things at the same time, all right? So that was a lot. Uh, yeah, Kelly's right, double screen is uh, worth it. Uh, all right, so the whole purpose of accounting is to basically create these two reports. The balance sheet gives you a picture of what you look like at a certain point in time. The P&L shows you a movie of transactions over a period of time. And the, it's very important that when you set your books up, there's all these lists that you need to set up. And the very first one is your chart of accounts list. It's the most important list of all. And each one of these lines are the lines that are in your chart of accounts list. So you need to set up your chart of accounts list with the idea in mind of what you want the P&O and the balance sheet to look like when you report to people. All right? So that's basically, um, that's basically what the chart of accounts is all about. It's basically the lines that go on the two reports. So I want to talk about your chart of accounts list. Where is it? Um, how? And I'm, I'm, I'm going to talk about it in kind of two ways. First thing I want to talk about is just basically how you maneuver around the chart of accounts list. How do you add an account? How do you subtract an account? How do you... Uh, uh, edit an account, those kinds of things. And then after that, uh, we're going to talk about what your chart of accounts should really look like. Uh, and that's kind of what we're going to make this big again. Sorry, I'm probably making this sick with all these screens. Uh, but anyway, we'll just stick to this one screen again. So the, when you set up a QuickBooks Online file, and I assume most of you, it only takes two seconds to set it up. You just put some basic information. It gives you a chart of accounts. And it will be wrong. It won't have the things you want, and it will be kind of a mess. And I encourage you 
to change it and make it be like you like it. All right? So um, to add an account, to edit an account, to get rid of an account, I'm going to show you how to do it. First of all, where do you think the chart of accounts list would be? Where do you think you'd go to get to it? And it's one of those things I've talked about. Um, where do you go to set things up? Because that's where the chart of accounts is. Now, Tracy Plus, that's where you go to add a transaction, okay? So gear, or Ann said the flower, that's where you go right here. Now, some people are saying you can go over to this accounting section, you can get to it. That means you've already realized that it's there, but most people don't understand this stuff. I usually make it go away. So you're right, but I'm telling you, just make it easy. For new users, we're going to go to the gear, and here's where chart of accounts is right here. So that's where your chart of accounts is. So the next thing I need you to understand is how to add an account. Now you'll see that there is a, an account. There's a button at the top left that says New, and you can click on it, and it will allow you to add an account. Okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to talk about how to add an account. All right? So the first thing you have to do when you're creating a new account and believe me, if you don't understand what your chart of accounts should be, we're going to talk about that after. Okay? Right now we're just kind of giving you the nuts and bolts of how to deal with the chart of account list itself. So the first thing it wants to know is what type of account it is. And the types are very important because they determine whether the account and the numbers related to it appear on the balance sheet or on the profit and loss. So if I pick income as my type of account, where do income accounts appear? On the balance sheet or P&L? Y'all chat me up and give me an answer. Balance sheet or P&L? What do you think? Where do, yeah, Heather got it right first, P&L. Now if I pick bank account, where do bank accounts appear? Balance sheet or P&L? Balance sheet or P&L? What do you think? Yeah, the balance sheet. Now if you do pick the wrong type, in most cases, you can change the type and move it, and it will move the account as well as all the transactions to the right statement that it's supposed to be on. But anyway, so I'm going to create an account. These account types are fixed. You can't create your own, and they are second nature to whoever it is that does your tax return or your audit or whatever. They're second nature. So if you don't know what type it should be, ask that person. All right? Now, but I'm just going to ask you. I'm going to create an account for a very expensive piece of computer equipment I bought. It cost $50,000. What type of account is that? And it's one of these on the list. Fixed asset. Perfect. So I click that. Heather, you just won $10,000 for answering first. Way to go, Heather. Just kidding. You're not winning $10,000. All right. So, <laughs> so here's the type. Now, they have this other thing here that's called the detail type. This is meaningless. Do not fret about this. All this is is a suggested name, and they have some suggested names. All right? So I want to call mine computer equipment. I don't see anything in here that says computer equipment. It's irrelevant. I'll just click fixed asset computers. The name is what appears here. So watch what happens. I click fixed asset computers. And that's the name that appears, but then I can just change it to the name that I want it to be. All right? And uh, I'll put in software. All right? That's it. Okay? Now, the next thing that they want is they want an account number. Now, account numbers are in a way, a way of identifying an account with a number in addition to a name. Instead of it being called computer equipment and software, it's also known by its number, which is uh, 1610 or something like that. Okay? So uh, I'm going to put 1610. And the numbers turn out to be very important, and we'll talk about that in a minute. The rest of these fields you can leave blank. Okay. You do not have to put anything in a description field. You don't need to have a sub-account. You don't need to put the original cost if you don't want to. Okay? So you don't need to put anything here. All right? You can leave these fields blank. Okay? So I'm going to click Save and Close, and it creates the account. And now I'll be able to use the account when I'm entering transactions. 
Now, uh, if your screen does not have a number field, which Holly doesn't, that means you have to turn the feature on, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And I think you'll be very happy because there's a very important reason why you want to use account numbers. But anyway, so um, uh, that's how you add an account. Now I want to talk about how to get rid of an account. And let me just tell you something here. Let me paint you a little uh, Sub-accounts do need numbers as well, Lyman. Um, so let me just tell you something here. Now I want you to listen very carefully because this may be you. The nonprofit started years ago. Doing bookkeeping is not what they were into. So they didn't really do very much. Maybe they kept it on pieces of paper. Then somebody went and got QuickBooks, and they didn't get any training. And so anytime anything needed to be tracked, they created an account for it. And so the account list started growing, and it had all these weird things in it that nobody knew what they were. Then that person left. Then the next person came in. They didn't have training, and boobity bobbly boo they keep adding accounts. Then they leave. Then you come in, and suddenly you're looking at a giant chart of accounts list. It's huge, and you don't even know what half these things mean. And basically you tell me that, yep, Stephanie's like you know us. You've inherited a mess. So tell me how many of you are listening today that say, you know what, I've inherited a mess. Douglas will get to you in a minute. Um, <clears throat> how many of you are inherited a mess? I just want to see. Yes. Yes. So it's a lot of us. So listen carefully. And this is almost like a therapeutic thing I want to tell you. Let me tell you something. You're the one in charge of the books. If you don't know what an account is, get rid of it. Okay? Don't be scared to get rid of an account. Okay? Do not be afraid. And let me show you. When you go to get rid of an account, you just click on the right-hand side here, and you can't delete it. And by the way, this used to say delete a few months ago, but it never really deleted the account. Rather, it makes the account inactive. So you can make an account inactive even if it has transactions in it. All right? So don't worry about that. This account I'll make inactive, and it's just going to disappear. All right? Now I can scroll down. Move this thing. I can scroll down, and I'm going to go to an account that uh, that account didn't have any transactions in. But I'm going to go to an account that does have transactions in it. And uh, let's see, I just got to find where is the account that I'm looking for, and it is not here, and that's really frustrating. All right, well, so we won't worry about that. Uh, what I want to tell you is, well, I'll try one. Let me see. I'll try and delete repairs and maintenance. And it, well, if you don't delete it, you make it inactive. Are you sure? Great. Now, it's still there. It'll still be on reports. Okay? So let me go to, I'm going to pull up a profit and loss. Uh, let me go to the dashboard here. And I'm just going to pull up a report. And even though I have deleted, what was it, repairs and maintenance? Repairs and maintenance will still be here as long as there's some transactions associated with it. Let's see. I've got to make the date range. Here we go. So here, repairs and maintenance, it's still here. It just says deleted next to it in parentheses. So it's still there. It's just that you can't use it on future transactions. So in other words, when you go to enter a transaction like a check or a bill or something like that, we'll click on a check. And notice this says category. They mean account. You just won't see it in your list. So you won't use it in the future, but it will still be there in the past. A common question people have is they want to be able to see the accounts that have been inactivated. Now, this is a little weird. Now, do you see a little gear or flower, not the big one at the top, but the little one that's at the top of the chart of accounts list? It's all the way on the right there. You see it? I'm zoomed in so you can see it, but now I'm going to point at it. 
It's right here. If you click on this gear, it will open. And if you click Include Inactive and you check the box, anything that has been inactivated will appear. All right? So we'll go down to our Repairs and Maintenance. And we should see, yeah, here they all are now. And yes, Janet, you can make it active again by just clicking Make Active, and then it makes it active again. All right? So that's what the deal is with that. Uh, Mary, I just showed you how to get the little window. That you click this little gear right here. You click it, and then you check this box that says Include in Active. All right? So that's what the deal is with that. So that's how you make something inactive uh, and make it active again. Uh, how do you edit something? Well, that's fairly easy. You click over here on the right next to the account you want to edit. You click Edit, and this allows you to change the name of it or the number. One thing I like to do is if I have multiple checking accounts, I like to put the last four digits of the account number here. Uh, so that uh, it reminds me or so I know which account I'm looking at uh, there. And for some reason I get real, I don't know, I'm superstitious about this. I like numbers. Yeah, that looks like a happy number, so I'll do that. But anyway, <laughs> I don't know. I, I need therapy. But anyway, so uh, that's uh, the uh, way of changing it. Now, if you change the name like that or you change the number, it's going to change on all future transactions, and it's also going to change on all past transactions. So if you look at a report that you printed out, say a P&L for 2017, and then you change the name of an account and you print that report out for 17 again, the name's going to look different. So if you're one of these where once you print something out, you, want to own it, you don't want it to ever look different, well, then you can't change any names. Okay? So that's the deal uh, with that. Now, merging. Now, that's another thing that's uh, kind of cool. I, you know what I think I'm going to do is, uh, let me see, I'll do this one down here. Um, so a lot of times we end up with multiple accounts that are really the same thing. This happens all the time. Uh, I'm trying to figure two accounts that I want to merge here. Uh, let's see, I'll merge... Uh, I know I'm just wasting time at this point. Uh, I really should just pick two. But I'm trying to pick two that make sense, and I can't find two that make sense. So let's say postage and delivery and printing and reproduction. Let's say we just want to have one called postage and printing, and we want to merge them together. Okay? So I'm going to tell you how to merge it. I'm going to tell you how to get the numbers in a second. Okay? Um, and Lisa, yes, you should clean your desktop up before um, uploading it to QBO. All right, so um, here's uh, the deal. I'm going to tell you how to merge, and then I'm going to show you. So what we're going to do is we're going to basically pick a name that we want. So let's say I want to call it Postage and Printing. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to change the name of both of these to the exact same name, Postage and Printing. And when I do that, it's going to say, that name's already in here. Do you want to merge them? And you say yes, and it will. So let me show you how to do this. So I'm going to go over to this first one, Postage and Delivery. I'm going to edit it. And I'm going to change the name to Postage and Printing. Uh, let's see. Great. Now I'm going to change the other one, Printing and Reproduction. I'm going to change that name to Postage and Printing as well. And Printing. You see that? And I'll zoom in for those of you who are too small. The name is already being merged. Would you like to merge the two? You say yes and it will merge them. Now, not only is it going to merge the names, but it's going to merge the dollar amounts as well. So if you notice here, you see how we have postage and delivery as one line and printing and reproduction as another one? Now, why do you suppose this hasn't merged on this report, by the way? And yes, Holly, you can do it on sub-accounts. Um, 
why do you suppose this hasn't merged yet? I told you it merged. Why didn't it? What do I have to do to this report? Yeah, I need to rerun the report. That's something that's really annoying. You have to refresh the report. So I'm just going to go over here, and I think I can just click this Run button. And now if I go down, it says Postage and Printing. Now, what do you do if you decide you didn't like this and you want to undo it? Any idea what you do if you want to undo it because you didn't like it? Any ideas? I tell you what you do. You do nothing because you're screwed. You can't undo it, okay? <laughs> Once you merge, you can't. Oh, see you later, Janice. Yeah, you're right, Dean. You can't undo. That's right. So once you undo it, it, once you merge them, you can't merge them again. So let's cover the account numbers here. So the account number feature, this is a feature that you can turn on or off in the program, okay? Now to get to the feature, um, where do you think that you would get to the feature? I'm going to go back to the uh, home page here, the dashboard. Yeah, in the flower or the gear. So I'm going to click on the gear. Now this is what they call a preference. Do you remember where your preferences are, the little settings you can turn on or off in the program? Um, Anybody know where your, where your preferences are? They're in the gear, but where? Which one of these? Anybody know? Yes, account and settings. And when you go in here, there's, all, there's this column on the left, and this has all of your different settings. Uh, they're in categories here. So the one that relates to account numbers is advanced. We push advanced. And then do you see under chart of accounts where it says enable account numbers? You click this, make sure that's on, and you make sure that's on as well. All right? So once these are checked, that turns your account numbers on. So to the person who didn't have account numbers, now you know how to turn them on. Now once you turn them on, all of your accounts will need numbers. All right? So how do you add those numbers? Well, you go to the flower again or the gear, and you go to the chart of accounts list, now, there's a couple of ways to add the account numbers. See this one, it doesn't even have an account number. One thing you can do is you can click on the gear and you can click edit, and then you can add the number right there. But let me just say this. A lot of times when you're trying to figure out what number you should put, you don't really know like what number you should put. Like It's hard to know. Um, so let me explain to you the account numbers. First of all, there is not an accounting god that has said, office supplies, thou shalt be ever known as 6285, thy will be done. That doesn't happen, okay? You can make the account numbers whatever the heck you want them to be, okay? So that's the first thing I need you to understand. Now, you will see that in the accounting world, usually assets are one and liabilities are – fixed assets are – no, liabilities are two and equity is three. You usually start with those numbers. But you can even make them letters if you want. Okay? Now, Kelly wants to know why we need account numbers. Okay? Now, let me tell you why you need account numbers. The reason why you need account numbers, I'll show you. I'm going to turn these numbers off. I'm going to go to the chart of accounts list – I mean to the – Settings. I'm going to go to Advance, and I'm going to turn the account numbers off. Okay? Now, when I turn the account numbers off, I'm going to go back to my report. I'm going to refresh my report. Now, notice what happened here. I want you to look at the P&L. What order is the P&L in? Look at the expenses. Bank contract labor, dues and subscriptions, health insurance. What is the order that this is in? It's alphabetical. That's right. Now, in the desktop version of QuickBooks, of those of you that are used to using it, you can change the order in the desktop version manually. You cannot do that in the online edition. It is always either alphabetical or numerical if you use account numbers. So do you see why you would want to use account numbers? Because if you don't have account numbers on, look at your first expense account. Bank charges, that's not what you usually want to see. You want to see salaries usually, but that begins with the letter S. 
So the only way to control the order that the, that the, um, the uh, reports appear in is to use account numbers, okay? And the order that they appear in here is either alphabetical or numerical, all right? So what we're going to do is we're going to turn back on account numbers, enable account numbers. I'm going to click Save. Oh, and I want to show the account numbers as well. All right. And now when I go back to my chart of accounts, you'll see the numbers are there. And if I go back here and just hammering home the point, look at this very carefully, I'm going to go ahead and refresh this report. And you'll see it's now in a different order. Salaries is up top, which is where we want it. Yeah, so it's for appearance sake. One more thing, Kelly, uh, this is going to make your life uh, better. You're going to be happy about this. If you're thinking, oh, great, Greg, I've got to go in here, I've got to click Edit, and I've got to add each number, click Save, then go to the next account, click Edit, got to put the number, click Save, and I've got to make sure that I do it in the right order, that's a pain in the butt. So over here, let me zoom in again. You see the, not the little gear, that's where we went to get things and activated to show, but do you see the little pencil there? That pencil, if you click that pencil, look at this, I can go in here and change these numbers all at the same time. Isn't that cool? So you can see easily what the order is going to be. So you got to tell me that's cool, okay? So somebody tell me that that's cool. Yeah, okay, thank you. It's really nice. Now, before you go to do this, uh, at the, when you're done, you click Save at the bottom, but I'm just going to save you some time here. Go ahead and change like 20 of them at the same time, and then click Save. Don't do your entire list, because sometimes there'll be a glitch, and you'll do the entire list, you'll click Save, and then there'll be a hiccup, and they'll say, oh, it didn't save, and then you'll have to do things over again. So just do like 15 or 20 at a time. Okay? So that's what the deal is with that. Now, Lyman, his frustration is the chart of accounts is too big, which means that when they run the P&L, it's too long. So that's why it's very important to talk about, we're going to talk about this next, what your chart of account should really look like. So we're going to break this discussion into kind of three areas. First, we're going to talk about what the balance sheet account should look like, and then we're going to talk about what the income and the expense accounts should look like. Okay? So, um, but uh, before we do that, uh, I think what I'm going to do, because we've got about a half hour left, and I like to kind of do things nice and easy here. So I'm going to stop for a second. I'm going to go back into the slides, and I'm going to run another poll. Uh, and this is a very important poll for you to take. So be sure that you take this poll. We use it to make sure that you're listening. We've got 160 people on the line. We want to know what the meaning of life is, and I want everyone to answer. Now think about this before you answer. What is the meaning of life? to serve others, to love, family, insert deep spiritual message here, and then the answer is 42. So tell me what the meaning of life is. It's very, very important that you understand the meaning of life. I mean, otherwise, what the heck are we doing here? So uh, we've got about 60 people that have answered out of 159. So again, we've got people looking at Facebook or going to the bathroom maybe, so Paul, Paula, Rebecca, Sarah, uh, Stacy, Sue, Vonzella. Vonzella, what an awesome name. Vonzella, are you there? Chat me up if you're, in, if you're there. I want to see your name, Vonzella. Uh, Vonzella, are you there, Vonzella? Okay, so Vonzella's in trouble because Vonzella is not listening to me right now. Oh, there you are, Vonzella. Okay, so let's go ahead and skip to the results. And there we go. So number one is to love, which is great. The seminar we did a couple of days ago, that was number one. And number two, we are tied between serving others and the answer is 42, which is awesome. I totally agree. Um, 
And uh, let's see, Tom says, 42 is the answer, what's the question? And I would tell you that no matter what the question is, the answer is 42, all right? And if you don't understand my sense of humor, then that just means that, um, well, I'm a weird person, so you'll just have to understand that I'm a weird person. But in fact, there's a number of other people that are weird as well. All right, so <laughs> having said that, uh, there's one more thing. Uh, that I want to go through here. And this would be, if you feel like you're learning, and I'm somebody that you can learn from, I have a newsletter that comes out once a month. It's only once a month. I promise you, you will not get anything else. We're not going to advertise to you. The newsletter is an e-newsletter, and it gives you a link to a YouTube video that shows you how to do something in QuickBooks. So I want everybody to answer either yes or no, and then uh, uh, TechSoup will give me these email addresses. I promise you, you will not be getting a bunch of junk email from me. I promise. So uh, yeah, I know, Edward, 22% of you are weird. Uh, so we got about 105 answers. We got 45 people that are still not listening. Bradley Wells. Bradley Wells, are you there? Say hello, Bradley. Bradley, are you there? Bradley, Bradley? There is no Bradley. All right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and skip to the results, and it looks like pretty much everybody wanted it, uh, with the exception of just a few people. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen again, and this time we're going to get into the specifics of what your accounts should be. And I'm going to talk about this kind of in two sections. First, I'm going to talk about what the balance sheet account should be. And that's actually pretty easy. That's not really that complicated. Um, and to do this, I'm really basically just going to pull up a chart of accounts list. So um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm going to pull up a balance sheet report. So I'm going to go to reports. And I'm going to go to a balance sheet. And here's a balance sheet. So here's the account that you're going to want. Everybody is going to need to have an account here for each one of your accounts in real life. So if you have more than one bank account, you'll have a separate one, one for each bank account. If you have receivables, and I know most of you don't, but some of you do invoice people, you will need a receivable account. Okay? Another one that people always need is fixed assets. Now, I have just, one, just two, one for office equipment and one for furniture. If you're a really small nonprofit and you just started, you don't need that. You can just have one called furniture and equipment. If you're a really big nonprofit, maybe you have one for furniture, one for equipment, one for building, one for land, one for leasehold improvements, and one for vehicles. Those are the six that you usually see if you're a big organization. One for equipment, one for furniture, one for building, one for land, one for leasehold improvements to the building, and then a final one for the vehicles. Okay? Now when it comes to your account at the bottom of the balance sheet, you'll need an account for your payables. So that account you'll have. QuickBooks gives it to you automatically. You'll need an account for each one of your credit cards. So that is something a lot of people don't realize this, but if you set up an account in QuickBooks for each one of your credit cards, you can download the charges so you don't have to sit there trying to enter the bill line by line. The charges just get entered every day. It's very neat. Um, if you are using a QuickBooks payroll service, it's QuickBooks payroll, it comes for an extra charge with your software, then you want to have a payroll liabilities account, and you want to have sub-accounts for each one of the liabilities uh, that you may own. If, however, you're with ADP or Paychecks or some other outside of QuickBooks payroll service, then you really just need one account called payroll liabilities. If you have any loans, you'll need an account for that. And the equity accounts, just leave them where they are. Don't worry about them. All right? So that's basically your balance sheet account. Nothing too confusing there. Um, and uh, let's see. 
Dean, chocolate storage vaults. That's the name of one of your assets? Uh, how about a debit? So, Tom, a debit card is just like a check, so you don't need to have a separate account for it. It comes directly out of your bank account, whereas a credit card is really a separate account that has a balance in it. All right? Um, now, donations, now these are just the balance sheet accounts. What you're talking about, Janet, with donations is the P&L accounts or the income accounts. Brighton wants me to explain about equity a bit. Now, I could talk for hours about it. Let me just tell you this. Equity is simply the difference between the assets, which is everything you have, and the liabilities, which is everything you owe. So we have $107,000 here of, of assets. We owe 66000 so what's left over is forty. So it's basically the difference between what we have and what we owe. All right? So that's what the deal is with that. All right, so um, let's move on to the P&L accounts. All right? Uh, let's see. Kelly wants to know how to use QuickBooks for memberships, the details of – so that's obviously a transaction question. We're going to cover it in the three-day webinar. I can also help you with tech support. Don't have time to do it right now. Uh, we're doing – this is a setup class for new users, all right? So, um, but if I have time at the end, we can talk about it. So what should your accounts be if you are uh, – or what should your accounts be on your P&L? So what I'm going to do is really the best way to explain the right way to set up your income and expense accounts is to show you the wrong way. So I have a messed up file here, okay? And the goal really is, as far as I'm concerned, to – and this has to do with what uh, – whoa. Uh, this has to do with what somebody had pointed out earlier. I'm trying to remember – is the uh, – uh, somebody was talking about how the annoying thing about their chart of accounts uh, – yes, Angela, we will. Uh, the annoying thing about uh, accounts is that they end up with so many that their P&L is too long. And what that means is the board of directors won't read it. And so what I want you to do is I want you to have very few income and expense accounts, enough to where the whole P&L will fit just on one page because then the board will actually read it, okay? It's more digestible that way. So in order to do that, we're going to save the income and expense account for only the most important things that we need the board to see and to make me, the accountant, happy. The rest of the stuff that you need to track, we're going to track them in other places, okay? So having said that, the best way to show you the right way is to show you a chart of accounts that was set up wrong, okay? So I'm going to make this all dates. All right. So how many of you get grants? How many of you get grants? Go ahead and check if you get grants. Let me know. Who gets grants? Who gets grants? Yes, a lot of you do. A lot of you do. So do you see how this person has set up an income account called restricted grants? Don't do that. The most important thing you've got to find out about a restricted grant is how the money was spent so that you can report to the funder where the money went to. Having an income account for that does not help. It also makes the data entry more complicated because if I get a grant that's restricted from a foundation, I don't know whether to put it down here under foundation or put it up here under restricted grants. So don't do that. The Green Truth Grant, the United Fund Grant, this is the person who set up a separate uh, account for each one of their grants. So that's crazy. We're going to use a different list for that. It's actually the customer list, and we talk about that in the full training. So I don't want you to do that in your chart of accounts list. When it comes to your income, that is unearned revenue, and by that I mean the revenue that's just kind of given to you either from foundations, corporations, individuals, whatever, you want uh, to have just these four accounts. Now, there's always exceptions, but in general, individual contributions, 
corporate grants, foundation grants, government grants. That's how I need to report it on a 990. That's how I report it on an audited financial statement, and that's something that the board can digest, okay? So notice how we don't get very much money from the government, 35000 whereas we get a lot of money from foundations. That's something that can maybe spur a conversation at the board level. Hey, why are we not getting money from the government? Maybe it's an opportunity that we're missing, or maybe it's because we're an arts organization and the government doesn't give arts any money these days. So it just depends, but at least it's something that's digestible and easy to understand. We're going to track our restricted grants in a different place. We're not using the chart of accounts for it. Okay? The other thing, um, membership dues. So see, some of you have income other than just donations and grants. You provide services or products in exchange for money. Maybe you have tuitions. Maybe you have memberships. Maybe you sell T-shirts. Maybe you have ticket sales. Maybe you have registration fees. So, and typically, we'll take membership as an example. Typically, you have different levels of members, like, like um, a, uh, a lifetime member versus an affiliate member versus a general member. And you want to track how much you got of each type of member do not use the chart of accounts for that. Don't get granular when it comes to your earned income. There's another list in QuickBooks called the product service list. That's where you use to track those details. So I just have one lump account called membership dues. All right? So that's the income accounts. Uh, so let me stop for a second and just take a couple of questions here. And unfortunately, I'm going to start at the bottom and work my way up. Are individual contributions donations? Yes, donations and contributions are the same thing, Lorraine. Are all corporate donations considered corporate grants? I think so, yes. A uh, donation and a grant are the same thing. It's just more where it comes from. Heather, if you did it with sub-accounts, would, would just the main one show up on the report? Yes, that's true, but I still don't want you to use sub-accounts because it makes the chart of accounts too long, and there's additional pieces of information that you can use if you use the product services, like it tells you the number of members that you have. Sub-accounts don't do that. Scrolling up a little bit, um, uh, Bob, can you comment on the differences between Windows, Mac, Android versus QBO applications? Uh, I've not had a problem with any of those, Bob. Uh, the online edition works no matter what. Um, Paul wants to know about setting up loan accounts. I can show you how to do it at the end if I have time, or I can do it in tech support. Yes, we're going to learn about classes, Angela, in a second. Uh, when you upload an account and add a category, does it change all of the same transactions? No, it does not, Douglas. You have to repoint those transactions. Sandra, I have a question about nonprofit reports. We always have carryover balances at the end of the year. Some of those funds are from grants. How can we create an income and expense report that reflects the funds? Something I teach in restricted grants, don't have time to do it here. I can show you with the tech support. It's also in our training products. Um, the elephant in the room is that April 10th is the cutoff for QBO Plus resources. TechSoup is working on getting QBO advanced on the product list, but two questions. What, okay. So, uh, Bob, I'm not aware of this, so um, you know more than I do. Perhaps uh, the people at TechSoup can talk about the different options uh, in terms of QuickBooks offering. I did not know that they're no longer offering on TechSoup the QuickBooks Plus. That's surprising to me. We'll cover that at the end. Um, William, if you want to track funds, we're going to use something called classes for that. We'll do that in a minute. And let's move on. We've got 15 minutes left. I'm just trying to get the questions answered. Now, when it comes to the expense accounts, that's where people screw up the most. Let me move this down. Uh, uh, let me move this down a little bit. And there we go. Now, the reason why people screw up the most when it comes to expense accounts is because they um, yeah, is because they when you enter expenses in the land of nonprofits, there's really two things that you need to track about them. So I'm going to pull up a little word document here, and let's just go over this. 
So when it comes to expenses, let me just type this. Expenses, we'll make it nice and big for you to see with small screens. There are two kind of things that you need to track about them. One of them is what I call the natural category of the expense. The natural category, natural category of the expense. And by that, I just mean the natural way that you think about expenses. Somebody chat me up and tell me some natural categories. Tell me some natural categories of expenses. Um, just off the top of your head, give me some. Yeah, first one, salaries, exactly. Um, utilities, rent, exactly. So these are the natural way of thinking about the expenses. Uh, utilities. <laughs> utilities. Okay, there we go. Great. All right, so Douglas said event. So I want to talk about that. Dean, I'm not even going to say that on the air. All right, Douglas said event. Now, event, that is not a natural category. It's, it, some people call this the object of the expense. What is it for? If I put event, I don't know what it is. What do you mean event? What is it? Is it postage? Is it printing? What is it for the event? So that's the natural category. You're not supposed to put things like events. Uh, another one, program service. That's another thing you're not supposed to do. Fundraising expense, that's another thing you're not supposed to do. Travel is good. Because what is fundraising, Kathy? If I was on the board and I saw an expense account called fundraising, I don't know what is it, travel? Is it, did you take a trip to our Barbados? Is it, is, it, is it supplies? Is it food? See, that's the natural category. So the thing like program service or event or fundraising, that's the second category. And the second category is the function of the expense, okay? The function of the expense. This is the why of the expense. And there are three main functions, and funders want to know that most of your money is being spent in the bucket one, the first function, and not the other two. So what are the three functions of an expense? There's three different uh, groupings of them. And, uh, yeah, one is called programs, and this is what the one. They want to make sure you spend all your money on programs. Another one is admin. Some people call admin management and, and uh, general. And then the last one is fundraising. That's right, fundraising. So this, and more specifically, if it's a program, which program it is? Well, it's my education program, and then maybe you have another program for housing like that, okay? So if it's a program, which program? And so it's very important that we track this stuff. Do not track it in the chart of accounts list. Let me bring my little report back over. Do not track it in the chart of accounts list. You see how this organization, I'll make it bigger so you can see it, the Guidance Center, the Synergy Conference, the AWARE Campaign, these are programs if I had a synergy conference, yeah, I want to know how much I spent. But if I just put expenses to it, I don't know what they were. And for some reason, um, uh, people end up doing this probably because they don't know about QuickBooks, uh, about, about using QuickBooks if you're a nonprofit. And then it's like if I spend money on a synergy conference that's postage, I don't know whether to put it in the synergy conference here or should I put it in postage down here? And I have to know both pieces of information. If I'm doing your taxes or something or an audit, I need to know all your postage added together, and then I need to know the total of the Synergy Conference program. So what we're going to do is you want to use the chart of accounts list for just the natural categories, bank charges, dues and subscriptions, equipment, just the natural categories, and there's another list you're going to use for program, admin, and fundraising. And I think you already know that. What is that list? And some of you probably already know. What list are we going to use to track our programs, admin, and fundraising? Katrina got it right first. It's the class list. 
Now the class list is a feature that you need to turn on. I'm going to click on the gear, and I'm going to go over to Account and uh, Settings. And I'm going to go over to the uh, Advanced area. And under Categories, you'll see something that says Track Classes. And you want to ch check that one. And you also want to put this, Assign one to each row in a transaction. This will allow you to split a transaction between multiple programs or multiple classes. Then you've got to set your classes up. Now where do you suppose you would get to your class list? Where you would, do you suppose you'd get to your class list? Somebody chat me up and tell me. Where do you close? Yeah, it's in the gear, uh, and it's under all lists. The class list isn't listed here. You've got to click all lists, and then you click classes, and this is where you set up your classes. To set up a class, you go to New, and then you just fill it out. Okay? Now, the class list, I put numbers ahead of the names so that they would appear in the order that I want them to appear. Now, you bought yourself a little work because when you enter a transaction, I'm going to look at a check here. When you enter a transaction, you can put the account that it pointed to here, uh, postage, and over on the right side in the class, this is where you can put the program that it related to. And we'll put Synergy Conference. And we are going to run over a few minutes because uh, I want to at least mention budgets. Um, postage and delivery. And this will be admin. And you can do that in every transaction window in QuickBooks. Even on income, you can point it to classes. And the benefit of that, and let me get to this report, and then we'll finish up. A P&L by class, look at how beautiful this report is. This report is giving me not only a total, but it's also giving me columns for each program with the revenues for the program and the expenses for the program so that I can look at each program like a department or a division and say, my greenhouse center is losing $11,000, whereas my Synergy Conference is making money. All right? And I can also see the total amount of programs. All my program expenses are 190 I'm spending 55 on admin, 20 on fundraising. The total is 266. This report is a report that is required on your audited financial statements, and this is how the expenses are reported on the 990. So this, I think, is very valuable to you. Um, and uh, now I would use this. You know, I would use this all the time. So that's what classes are. Now we only have a few minutes left. So what I want to do here, and I know that I'm running behind, and I apologize very much for that. Um, I want to point out budgets real quickly just to show you where they are and how to enter them. Uh, you go to this little gear here, and you click on budgeting. And after this, I'm going to answer a bunch of questions. You click Add Budget, and here's where you enter the budget right here. Okay, you just type the numbers in. You can enter the budget monthly where you enter numbers in each one of these fields. Or if you enter the whole budget for the year, you don't want to enter it uh, by month, you just want to enter the whole year, then you put the budget in the very first month of your year. Now, you've got to name the budget first. I'll just put name. Pick your year that you want to enter a budget for, and then you just click Next and then you enter your budget. Okay? This little arrow here is for people that do want to enter their budget monthly, but they've got certain accounts where this, it's the same every single month, the expense, like rent. So I can just type 2400 here, and then I can click this forward arrow, and whoop, there it goes. All right? So once you've entered your budget, then you'll be able to look at it on a report. And it's weird. To get reports compared to budget, normally you would think you'd go to reports. But when it comes to budgeting, you don't do that. You go to the gear, 
you go to where you budget, and all of your budgets that you've entered are here. You can edit them clicking here, but you can also run. So I can run a budget to actual report right here. Okay? You can do a budget by program. You can also do a budget for a customer. So in order to do that, when you add the budget, you see subdivide, customer, and if it was program, you click class. We'll click that one. And then you pick the classes you want to enter a budget for. Typically, people will do it for every single one of their classes. And then when you click Next, oh, we've got to put a name in here first. When you click Next, here's where you enter the numbers. Now let me finish up here. A um, couple of things I want to point out. Uh, if you go to my site, and then we're going to do some questions. Uh, if you go to the QuickBooks Made Easy site, this is where you can sign up for our webinar that's coming up. You can just click on Live Seminars. And the webinar that you're going to want, it's a three-day webinar series here, and it's just for online users. Okay? And you can click on it there. There is a $50 discount for you. It's normally $199. I think it will only be $140 for you. You've got to get the code, which I'll show you in a second. Tech support is over here. And when you click on Tech Support for Nonprofits, um, it's usually, it depends upon the options, but for a year, let me see where this is. They just changed the website here. Um, for a year, it's usually $4.99 and online. $4.99, you're going to be able to get it for $1.99. We're giving you $300 off. So let me show you where those codes are so that you can get the discount. Uh, here are the codes right here. So you want to make sure that you copy these down. They'll send them out again. This sale, these discounts are very, very good. So this sale is only going to work for 48 hours. So it's going to end, now it says Thursday, it means Saturday. It's going to end Saturday night. Uh, that's wrong. It's going to end Saturday at midnight. So the code is tsw 50 off for $50 off the three-day webinar series or uh, $300 off tech support, and it's TSTS300. You can always get the QuickBooks Made Easy Essentials product. It's a training that's streamable. Uh, it comes with a handbook. It's six hours of learning, um, and it's always discounted. It's normally $229. You can get it from TechSoup for $109. So this is always there. These top two are only there for the next 48 hours. All right? So um, we are right at the top of the hour. Um, so how do you want to handle this, uh, Seema? Because uh, I'm over, but I want to answer these questions. So... Um, How do you want to do this? Yeah, I think since it's 12.31, um, we should probably wrap up. If you want to maybe take two questions, and then we can, we can wrap up after that. Okay, all right. So let me, let me see what I can do real quickly here. I'm not going to be able to show you stuff on the screen, uh, but I will be able. So Lisa, do I need classes for revenue? So basically, you use your classes for all your transactions, and it's the same classes that you would use for your expenses typically. I'm seeing here that you, you, you were suggesting doing ones for restricted, temporary restricted, and permanently restricted. You can do that, but I prefer to use the same class. If you have expen uh, income that's related to a program, you put it to that program. If it's unrelated, put it to the fundraising class. Uh, that way you can see how you did on a program. How do I switch my online monthly fleet to TechSoup annual? We talked about that at the beginning. You have to back up your data file, Linda, onto and use Chronobooks. Go to chronobooks.com. It will back up your online data file. Then go into TechSoup, purchase it from TechSoup, the new account, and then upload it again to the new account. Then cancel your old account. Um, can you enter budgets for customers? I already said that. Uh, let's see, can you budget with class headers across the top? Yes, uh, Jen, you can, but I don't have time to show you. I'll show you the tech support. 
Um, where would you carry over an amount from the prior fiscal year? Somebody else asked me that again. I'll need to do that in the tech support. Uh, what is the difference between a project and a class? A project is, it relates to your customer list. Uh, it usually is for grants. Uh, classes are for your programs. So uh, let's see. Um, how do costs like a mortgage or insurance appear in the class list? Uh, insurance, you usually break up between program admin and fundraising if it's insurance on the building. Same thing with interest on a mortgage. Because, well, the interest on the mortgage goes to admin. The principal goes to the loan that's on the balance sheet. Insurance gets split based on the square footage, Brian. Okay? Uh, you can do a P&L and job by a QBO. It's called a, a P&L by customer, and you'll find it in your list of standard reports. Uh, do your classes and customers transfer? Yes, they do, Lisa. And with that, uh, I think I will be done because this question looks too long. All right, so <laughs> Seema, did you want to address what they were talking about, or do you not know what's going on with the offering? Yeah, I sent, him, um, I, I, I sent him a message, so, um, and I offered Bailey's email address, so we'll, we'll get in touch with him afterwards. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay. Woo! Awesome. That was All a lot. Right. Okay. Thank you, Greg. That was, that was great. Um, so before you guys hang up, I just want to uh, encourage you to take our post-event survey. So any feedback that you have for us is always super helpful. Um, and uh, if you're on social media, feel free to give us a follow on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter. We also have our blog at blog.techsoup.org. Uh, we have a couple more webinars with Greg happening at the end of the month. So we have one on March 19th and then also on March 21st. Uh, we have several other webinars um, which you can check on our website techsoup.org slash community events to see what's coming up. We also have uh, TechSoup courses and then TechSoup services. So if you're interested in any of our courses which um, are similar to webinars, but they go you know, in, in much greater detail. We have topics around Google Analytics, Facebook advertising, um, and you can see the full list on our TechSoup Courses catalog page. And then we also offer TechSoup services, which is help desk, managed IT, cloud implementation, and then also Office 365 uh, support. So just so you guys know that. And then we have a coupon code. If you want to sign up for a TechSoup course, you can get 10% off your, um, your first course. All right, so I think that is it. We are over time. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Bill, Zareen. Uh, thank you to the attendees for staying on this long, and we hope to see you at our next webinar. All right. Bye, guys.